Hello and welcome to Kvikminderpod, an Icelandic cinema podcast. I'm Rob Watts, and as ever, I'm joined by my good friend Ellie Cawthorn for another journey through the cinema of Iceland. Before we begin, just a quick public information notice to say Ellie and I dropped by the Flixwatcher podcast recently to discuss the Jason Statham classic, Crank, and we had a blast. So if you fancy hearing us chat about something other than Icelandic film for once, do check the episode out on your podcast app of choice. This week, though, we return to South East Iceland for a proper deep dive discussion of Helena Palmerson's Godland, just in time for its UK release. You may remember we were lucky enough to see Godland when it premiered at London Film Festival back in October, and if you want to wet your whistle ahead of seeing the film, then check out our spoiler-free discussion from Series 4. Now, however, Ellie and I get into the nitty-gritty of this stunning piece of work following Danish priest Lucas's epic journey across Iceland to build a church and spread the word of God. In cinemas from the 7th of April, including the watershed here in Bristol, I urge you to see this on the big screen and then come back for our chat. Hi Ellie. Hello Rob. How's it going? Good, thank you. How are you? I am well, thanks. Uh, better for having seen this film again that we're going to discuss. Absolutely, of course. Yeah, love a bit of um, Godland, don't we? Mm, but different experience this time, watching at home rather than in the cinema. Yeah, so we should say we have seen this film. We saw it at London Film Festival. We recorded a little... Mini pod? Yeah, mini spoiler-free pod. So you can always go back and listen to that if you haven't yet seen the film back in October, I think. And now it's being released, finally. Woo! Into cinemas, like we hoped, by Curzon. Comes out on April the 7th in the UK, which is amazing. And so, obviously, this is the right time to do a full spoiler-rific chat about it. Mm, And I mean, this is a two and a half hour movie, so our little chat before didn't really touch the surface, did it? Didn't touch the sides. Barely. And we are now going to sit here for two and a half hours and discuss it. <laughs> you hadn't depth. told me it's going to be two and a half hours. <laughs> yeah, I wouldn't I have agreed. Only right. only right. I would have had to eat my dinner first, if so. No, it's not going to be that long. It will be a classic Quick Minder Pod episode. Don't you worry. So, yeah, this is Helena Palmerson's third feature film after A White White Day and Winter Brothers. And it stars Danish actor Elliot Crossett Herver, who is in Winter Brothers. It also stars Ingvar Sigurdsson. Woo, Ingvar! Yeah, 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 yeah. Succession starts in two days and uh, he was in that, wasn't he? Mm. Brilliant. So yeah, Ingvar and also the director's daughter, Ida mekin And this is just, it's just epic, isn't it? There's no other word for it. It is epic. It's cinematic in scope. The performances are just beautiful. It's almost like two films in one, which we can talk about. Yeah, it is. So, I mean... Two for the price of one. What what more can you ask for, <laughs> eh? Uh, but it, ostensibly, this is a film about a 19th century Danish priest, <laughs> which is always how you start your synopsis for the best films it's ever. Absolute sales pitch there. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> and uh, yeah, he basically is sent to Iceland to build a church and get everyone to go, basically. Spread the word of God. It's like a missionary kind of... Vibe. Yeah. And that's literally the through line of the film. Mm. But we see Lucas, who is the priest, we see him sort of battle with the elements, with Icelandic landscapes, with the nature. The people. The people, of course. And then ultimately, well, we're going to spoil the whole thing anyway, settling for a while in Iceland as the church is being built. And this is brutal. Mm. I mean, there's a lot to unpick here, isn't there? As you say, it's kind of a film of two halves. The first half, we have him traveling across this landscape. And it's it's like one of those great journey films or survival films. What's the the long way down? No, that's the motorbiking one. Not that. The Ewan McGregor (laughs) biking one. No, no. The one where they escape from a Siberian gulag. It's got Sir Sharon in it. The long, long long way back or something the way 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 back way way back that one way 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 back no no someone else british um anyway okay that one they basically have to go from the siberian gulag to to china but this sense of just like a really grueling journey Mm. um 
that's very much the vibe in the first hour of this film. For sure. And I actually did a little time code check. Oh, yeah. Don't worry about it. And <laughs> we essentially start a new narrative, really, ish, um, at 58 minutes. Okay. We're introduced yeah. to a whole new cast of characters when he finally reaches his destination and settles for a while in Iceland. And then we've got kind of a new layer it's not a new story, but it's a new layer of the story, I think, mm-hmm. then develops, unfolds from that point. And to me, they feel like quite distinct halves. Obviously, there's a same through line, but they feel like two stories within the same universe. What do you think? I think, yes, to a degree. They definitely feel like two stories, but the film still feels cohesive. It doesn't feel like mm. you've ended one film and started a completely different thing. Sort of the the whole, the way it's shot, everything about it is still the same we just be- it becomes more narrative driven and mm. character driven doesn't it in the second half F- feels a slightly more like a traditional film whereas the first half is very much a kind of road trip with very little dialogue and that i guess that ties into one of the big themes of the film which is language mm. but there's not a lot of chat for an hour is there no there's a lot of bloody good landscapes though this is true. It's a beautiful place. It's a beautiful and harsh place. I mean, the Icelandic Tourist Board should really thank these guys for their work on this film because it's incredible, some of the landscapes that we encounter. I mean, yeah, they're crossing, like, rivers. They're on the cliff edge. Like gla- like ice-laden glacier vibes. Yeah, the volcanoes going off in the yeah. background. It's just, yeah, really, really kind of brutal nature isn't it but Mm. stunning at the same time and it's it's a it's a reason in itself just to watch this film because the whole thing looks like a series of photographs another Mm. theme of the film but i could just you could take away all the dialogue especially from that first half and just watch the images because it's so stunning and you get such sort of vast landscapes in the same size image you get close-ups on people's faces or little kids uh, building little stone towers Mm. or dogs eating meat or what have you it's like ah it's just it's a beautiful thing um shot by maria von hauswolf who did helena palmerson's previous films obviously we've got a square ratio as well in terms of uh, the way that this is shot which is an interesting decision when a lot of what you're doing is looking at these vast mountain ranges and these wide vistas and these dramatic landscapes it's a really interesting decision to me to shoot it in a square ratio why do you think that decision was made well firstly you would expect to see that kind of stuff in as wider Mm, high def format as you possibly can wouldn't you Uh, and i'm sure the tourist board have done enough of that for themselves um i mean one of the themes of this film is it's supposedly based on a bunch of photographs that were found from a Danish photographer who rocked up in Iceland and documented the sort of southeast. First ever photos of the southeast of the yes. Iceland. Yes, and the film looks like a series of photographs. That box format, I think it's Academy Ratio, is it? 1331 one, or 133-1 um, with, yeah, with the box and the rounded edges making it look like photographs. I think this is, okay, partially to do with the theme of photography, yeah. but also the director... He uses this format often. Like we saw it in his short film, Nest. He does love a good static shot. Yeah. And Nest is that for 20 minutes. Again, we did an episode of that. So if you haven't heard it, it's on your feed. But he does, that's that's his style. And it just, for this film, it perfectly encapsulates what he is talking about, what we're witnessing. And it's just, it's beautiful to look at and different mm. as well. And also there's some incredible shots here, not just of landscapes, but of almost portraits. Mm. So we get the shots where Lucas, the priest, he's into photography and he's taking these photos of people and we just get a lingering shot on their face. Mm. Um, We're essentially looking through the the camera's lens, uh, meaning the camera is in this 19th century camera, not as in the camera Oh God, there's so many cameras. It's like a camera reception. But you know, the, we're looking through the 19th century priest's camera's mm-hmm. lens and have these just absolutely crisp, beautiful kind of moving photos mm-hmm. of people. And I thought that that was the, the ratio really 
gave us that sense. Well, we've seen we saw it in a white white day these portraits of the characters that mm. the director likes to put within his films, and they're always there. And for me, they always convey a, a sort of they help you sense th- of the character. So, yeah, help you understand the characters a bit more. You can see deep into their kind of eyes, their soul. You sort of understand what's going through their mind. And this is such a kind of ominous, otherworldly film. You kind of, and everyone is so just hammered by nature. But most of these people he's taking portraits of are Icelanders and they have lived there their entire lives. So it's quite interesting to focus on them looking back at this technology that they've never seen before mm-hmm. and wonder what are, what are they thinking at this time. Mm. It's a really interesting portrait or way of approaching this kind of snapshot of a time and a place isn't it because Mm -hmm. we're we're essentially coming to 19th century uh, Iceland through the eyes of Lucas's Danish priest we're kind of seeing it through him we I think we are given other perspectives as well but this theme that's really interesting of you know the alien in a foreign Mm -hmm. land but also there's there's another power dynamic at play there isn't there because it's about He's Danish, which is, you know, traditionally at this time, as I as I have learned. You've been doing some research, uh, you? <laughs> maybe. Um, basically, had a kind of cultural, I don't, I guess, they self-proclaimed supremacy over Iceland. Well, and, the Vikings did invade. Mm, it became it become. It came under Danish rule at yeah. some point, right? I guess. I guess the. A comparison, it's always kind of tricky, but an, an interesting comparison would be, um, I watched the film The Wonder uh, oh, recently with Florence, with Florence Pugh. Pugh. And that's about an English nurse who goes to 19th century Iceland. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that would be uh, my dream, Ellie. <laughs> Not Iceland, Ireland. Okay. An English nurse who goes to 19th century Ireland just after the famine. And the dynamics of what it means to be someone from England in that context, Mm. I thought had a lot of resonance with the situation that we're seeing here. And they talk about things, don't they? Like Danish Sundays where people are expected to speak Danish on Sunday because it's meant to be a more sophisticated language. And Mm. this idea that Icelandic is is everything that's kind of rough and ready and unsophisticated. And Danish is superior and... um, yeah. But also... I think that, to me, is at the heart of this whole film when I've watched it a second time. I think you're probably right. And, again, that plays into the language thing. I think, really, this film, on second watch for me, focused on Ragnar and Lucas and the language thing, in amongst exactly what you've just been saying about this this Danish Iceland sort of butting mm. heads. But the priest, or whoever he is who t- sets Lucas on his way, he does say... These guys know how to deal with it. You know, follow them. Let the guy, he's going to build your church because he's a, he's great at that too. Like there's a there's a bit of... Respect. Yeah, there's a bit of respect. There's a bit of sort of positivity towards them hidden in amongst it's a rough place to be. But that's an interesting relationship, isn't it? That relationship between Lucas the Priest and Ragnar, which you've highlighted there. Because to me, on the second watch, Ragnar is... Iceland yeah he's like everything that this place is like standing for like he's like of the earth well, you... and like of the landscapes and he like can just jump in like a freezing river and not care and he's like so part of that world mm-hmm. and then Lucas is everything that's Den- Denmark basically. <laughs> you know he's learning and he's trying as in he he represents scholarship and learning and this kind of um desire to in quote marks civilize things yeah um and it's like though the clash of those two characters is the clash of those two cultures i think they're one and the same yeah that's yeah that makes perfect sense Kevin close floor deep in your street episode you've and Kevin Kluser floating. Yeah. Do it, eh? Let go, sir. Yeah. You're going to get fired here, so why don't you get fired here? I'm going to start off here. 
Ich sehe hier keine Küsse vorhin her, so kann ich nicht Küsse. Så krydser vi her. Vi gør det nu. Ja, men vi snuer vi i et dag, finder vi hester, har vi kommet tilbage efter to dage, og vi har trukket støderne. Eller vi er lige tilbage en dag, finder vi græsmakker, og kommer tilbage igen to dage. To dage? Nej. Vi krydser nu. Gør det klart, at vi krydser floden i dag. Ragnar... Even down to those little moments where he's doing his yoga and his feet are like yeah. squidging like into a the mossy chi vibe. Yeah. And he just he is at one with the nature, like the moss envelops his feet and he's yeah, like say in the water. He's a rugged man. He knows how to deal with the cliffs, with the horses, with the weather. He's he's basically Lucas's savior throughout that entire first half. And I think that goes pretty much unmentioned. And I It's a fascinating relationship because in the second half, Lucas is got is completely obtuse with Ragnar, and he just very standoffish, doesn't want to speak to him. Um, and I'm not why he's been so good to him. Yes, okay, getting off a boat and having a shit time, and then meeting this guy who can't understand you, you can't understand him. He's a bit kind of what's the word? Oafish. Oafish, maybe rude. <laughs> <laughs> maybe it's not the great greatest of starts but like his actions should speak louder than the words that no one can understand let alone us as mm. the viewer uh but in that second half he's like gives him just doesn't give a shit he's helped him build yeah. the entire church as well i think that re- like i think probably again watching this for a second time has clarified my thoughts on this but i think the real kind of villain of the pieces lucas Mm -hmm. and he is going there with all these high-minded ideals about what he's going to do he's so naive yeah about the reality of the situation he thinks he's superior um like when ragnar says we shouldn't cross the river yes he says oh yeah we should it's like mate you don't know anything about the rivers what why are you demanding you know that you should cross the river yeah but he because he's falling apart because he can't handle it he decides to put everyone else at risk, mm. including his translator, Tul- Tulkur. Mm. I mean, what the fuck? <laughs> He's the, literally the only person who is like enabling you to yeah. converse with these people. And you've killed him? He really, his death was very, um, I thought was perhaps handled too suddenly. Perhaps. Or maybe that's the point that it's like, it happened in a blink, he was gone, and then that's it, he's just dead. Like, that's how dangerous the nature like nature yeah. is. And maybe Lucas, again, he just don't care. Mm. He just wants to be... He thinks... It, he think maybe he thinks it's got part of God's plan. Like, mm. he'll get there in whatever way he gets there. I feel like it's weird, isn't it? Because somebody getting ill, like, on, the, on that journey over there, he's, like, physically, like, decaying. But like, what is actually wrong with him? And also, it mm-hmm. makes me like, you shouldn't be like, oh well, he's physically weak. So, but but it's not but about is. him being physically weak. His his like external physical weakness is a sign of the interiority as well, right? Yeah, like he's just falling apart. He can't even he he can't be bothered with that. What is actually wrong with him? <laughs> what do you mean? What is wrong with I him? I mean, like he's like why it's just a wimp. <laughs> it's just a a Danish priest who is soft. But you know when he's so like when he's like I can't go on and he's like collapses and stuff. Yeah. Like is it is it just exhaustion? I guess it must be. But like I mean so much could be wrong with him that would even then just be undiagnosed as well. Like obviously the Icelanders have lived in this environment for centuries. So they're used to it. But he I mean he's been living in a nice home in settled modern Denmark Mm -hmm. and now he's like exposed to the elements he's running around doing far more exercise than he's probably ever done how do you think you would fare on this like cross Icelandic horse mission so I asked me like 10 years ago to be like great fine 
asked me five years ago, probably the same. Now, oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> Walking an hour from one side of Bristol to the other does me in. Like, I don't know if I could make it. For however not, long it takes. He's not even walking though. He's on a horse. Although that actually is a lot of exercise, isn't it? I don't know. I never got on a horse. Ooh, if someone wants to give me Icelandic horse lessons when <laughs> I'm next there, that'd be brilliant. But you know, he's got a tent. He's uh, It probably is quite cold at well, points. Another thing that's great about this film is the occasional moments of humour. Yeah, And when definitely. they're all sat on the uh, glacier and someone just is like, it's getting a bit cold now, isn't yeah. it? And, and uh, Lucas is just there like... <laughs> like icicles dripping off his nose and stuff like maybe maybe he's just like his body is physically unable to deal with this stuff like because mm. by the time of the midway point he's he absolutely looks like they've left dead. him for dead yeah absolutely would you be all right do you think um, can you ride a horse no i have ridden a horse ridden a horse and i've ridden a camel oh um one seems probably more comfortable than the other what the camel no, the horse. I was thinking the horse, but <laughs> if you ride a... Is it a dromedary with two humps? Yeah, that was what is I that did. Is that comfortable in the middle of the yeah, humps? Yeah, because you, you can, sit on the you've humps? got a little seat. Are the thing. humps like... Can you... Are they... No, they're quite solid. That's, yeah, you knew where I was going <laughs> What, with you're that. like wibbly? No. <laughs> yeah. No, but you're really... Ha- I guess it's scary on a camel. This is such a divergence because you're really high up. Okay. So, so like you feel like... Feel if, precarious. Yeah, because if you think about it, you're about eight feet off the ground. Maybe that's not true. Maybe it's six feet. But like you it's feel like if yeah. you fall off, it's a long way down. Hmm. But you feel kind of more secure. Okay. Whereas horses, I just, I don't know, they're a bit more... But like an Icelandic horse, you're about two inches off the ground. So it's fine. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> One thing I wanted to ask your opinion on in the journey is, I mean, a de- place I'm desperate to go to, It just before um, Tolka dies, yeah. we see him posing for a photo and it's in this like green oh, valley yeah, hill. Yeah, with the waterfall. That, with the waterfall. That is where I want to go more than any other. That looks like a spa- Star Wars island. It looks insane, doesn't it? It looks beautiful. But we have these shots of them um, at the waterfall, swimming and everything, alongside um, Ragnar telling this story mm. about eels. Yes. <laughs> a kind of strangely erotic tale of eels. Yeah. And what was your take, which which is set to some really unsettling music? The, Spooky yeah. music. Well, there's a lot to unpack from that one sentence there, Ellie. Can we go back? Go back to the environment. So that Mm. scene of them bathing and just embracing nature. Uh, Don't know where that is, but it's it's likely to be the southeast of the island, which is an area that Helena told us that he grew up in and is is familiar with. So everywhere they shot this film, he knew basically like the back of his hand which is great because it looked fucking hard work, um, essentially doing that journey. But with a film crew as well, like, Mm. that's madness to me. Um, But this area of the island is an area that no one had explored before. Obviously, there were some settlers. But it's, it's a tough place to be. And even now, on my trips, the last trip I went on, the Southeast Island, the ring road was closed because you couldn't, you just you can't get round to that part of the island. It's, the southeast is treacherous as fuck, um, which explains why it's so hard for them back then. If we can't even do it now, safely anyway, it's an area of the country that is kind of unexplored, and they're embracing it and its ruggedness. But at the same time, like you said, you've got this weird story from Ragnar, who obviously sagas and stories they're mm. all probably the the most abundant form of uh, entertainment for icelanders back then and uh, what does it mean i don't know he's like he talks about a guy who 
he knew. Which feels <laughs> a bit like didn't know him. okay, Ragni, oh, you've just my made friend's this up. cousin's auntie's brother. This happened to yeah, exactly. It sounds basically like a made up story. And he talks about the eels. Someone saw a load of eels, and they all sounded like woman's pleasure because okay, and then <laughs> because okay, <laughs> don't get and what then he and then he does does he do something to the eels or he wakes up and the eels have gone and then he finds that his wife has been sleeping with the men so then no, he goes no, and kills all the eels but isn't that a dream so within the story he tells of a dream that he'd had that night after he'd seen the eels of farmers sleeping with his wife then he goes and, and then kills he kills all the eels or well, he can't find the eels. No, he kills So the then eels. he goes to kill any eel he could ever find. I'm not sure what that story meant. Do you know what? I'm not either, but it did give me the sense of like those, the strangeness of like medieval tales. It has yeah. that vibe to it where it kind of expects, it tells the story like it's logical and you're like, eh, what? Where it's like, oh, and then she just transformed into an eel and then like that kind of thing. So... I guess maybe what I took from it was this sense of like a culture that's in, still like embedded in like really ancient lore and tales and myth and like oral traditions and oral histories mm -hmm. and that sense of, you know, it's also kind of mythical, isn't it? And and magical. And so we have the priests on the one hand saying, you know, the law of God is this. And then we have this other cultural influence, mm -hmm. which is from Ragnar. That's interesting. I hadn't picked up on that. I kept every shot and every sort of spoken word. I was like, right, what does this mean? How does it relate to these major themes mm -hmm. that we know are playing here? And that was just one where I was like, I, I can't, I can't, read. I just <laughs> no, haven't no. been able to read into that one. Um, but yeah, you maybe you're right. But it, everything about Ragnar during that journey makes Lucas feel more uneasy. Like this talking in another language, the singing in another language. Uh, the, again, maybe it's the same thing when when um, Ragnar is clearly singing like the names of people who've died. But like as a kind of Gregorian like chant, it's like... It. Tulko Ragnar Ragnar very vibesy great deep voice yeah that. it does sound a bit like a didgeridoo <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um but the whole thing is unsettling I imagine for Lucas, he's in a strange place. He's with strange people. A guy is doing some weird shit. Okay, he wasn't there for the story, but that's going to probably still freak out the other Icelanders. Uh, but then uh, to amplify all the strangeness is the music. Mm. Can you call it music? It's it's sort of horns. Yeah. Weird kind of, like you say, ominous. I don't know how to describe it. Soundscape. Vibe. Yeah, very unsettling, isn't it? Mm. Um, it's by the the score is done by Alex Zhang Hungtai, who I hadn't realised I knew who he was. But he was he used to go under the name Dirty Beaches. <laughs> Wonder why he changed it. Well, it's not, obviously not his. Can't uh, get taken very seriously, name. can you, with that name? Uh, but it's it's. It make it makes it feel like a horror film. Yeah, and like I just kept thinking, oh, something bad's gonna happen. Something bad is actually gonna, and it does happen. And Tolkur dies, and yeah, Lucas gets ill, and I mean, it's all building and building. The whole thing is just like crescendoing. It kind of s slows down at the beginning of the second half, and then it carries on again. It starts to build and build again. Mm. Um, and maybe we should move into the second half in a second. But a couple of things on that first half. Photography, obviously a key thing. We've touched on it a few times. But doing some reading for this episode, I'm pretty sure those Danish photographs, not real. Really? It's like a Fargo based on a true story thing. It's not. 
they just used that as a way into the film. Oh, okay. That's I think that's really interesting. Because I think when we first talked about this film, we said, oh, I would have loved to see those photos. I kept expecting them to appear at the end, yeah. Interesting. But this is what I've gleaned recently, and that would explain why. Although I also read that they did make these photos. So the one on the poster is one of the photos they actually took as a kind of, right, we're going to make the six or seven, whatever they are, photos. Um, and they're going to slowly reveal what they are over time. I don't know. Helena, if you're listening, it's time to get Instagram. We want to see those pictures. But also, such a treacherous journey. And Lucas is carrying the most like delicate mm. glass. But that's... So- what the Typical hell? Typical Lucas. That's Typical. the whole point, isn't it? Like, you know, that he's what he's just not taken the... It's like the person who turns up for, like, the big hike wearing plimsolls. And they're like, these will do. Like, he's just mm. not prepared. He doesn't understand. He doesn't understand. But also, he... That's... To him, that is more important than... Yeah. Than the people who might die getting him and the equipment across. I also enjoyed, like, after you've been through this, like... I mean, for us, it's an hour long slog. Mm. For him, it's a several weeks. It must be long um, slog. Yeah, we don't get a real sense of time of like death. It feels like a pain, long time. ice, snow, wind, and then when he gets there, and the guy, the guy who hosts him, basically Carl. says, "Oh, why don't you just take a boat?" Which is and such a slap in the face. Undermines the entire thing. Yeah, and he says, "Well, I guess I kind of wanted to see." The land and the people, but even as he's saying it, he's it's aware like, that it's why, it's yeah, stupid. What a dumb idea! Great for us. Made a great first <laughs> after a film, and that's another one of those moments of like, that's really darkly humorous. Like mm. you could have just sailed here. I'm just before you turned up to do this record. I went on Google Maps to see like, obviously I know nothing about sailing, but why? Where did? Where would they have landed when they did? get the boat down to twice and to to then walk across the island like would it not have been so the southeast is closer to denmark than anywhere else on the island of iceland but is the the village the settlement is definitely supposed to be the southeast is it i th- i think so i mean we don't really know how far he's gone mm. and where they are but from what i gather all the of whole- that first hour was just one day one day just work. the one day yeah <laughs> i mean the changeable weather like yeah. <laughs> Crikey! No wonder they uh, they think they're rough out there mm. living through that. Um, but just before we go into part two and part two of the podcast, I suppose at the end of that first half, we see one of those moments that kind of define the director's style. And again, Maria von Hauswolf's cinematography. This like five minute, three hundred and sixty degree kind of corkscrew shot where it starts on the sort of expedition crew and Lucas lying down, essentially dead, could well be dead. And they all wander off towards the town and leave him behind. And we just see Iceland. We see what it looks like. We see, it looks like paintings. It looks like scenery, doesn't it? Like Mm. those big, I can't remember what you call them now, the backdrops to like Mm. plays and things. And obviously early Hollywood films as well. And it comes all the way around. We see an eel, of course. (laughs) Uh, And then we settle on Lucas and his frail, ill body. And it's just, I don't know, I was just mesmerized. Like, Mm. I've got a note of here saying, probably wasting my time. I don't want to look away to make notes. (laughs) Oh, the irony. The irony, of course. Nothing really is happening, but you get a sense of time passing and... The, the yeah the majesty of the location mm. and it's it's amazing and it's at that exact point you think oh they've left him for dead potentially that we move into the second half uh, and meet some other characters who actually do some talking <laughs> <laughs> yeah we kind of go from hell into heaven don't we when the first scene of the second half kind of kicks in and we mm-hmm. see the two girls Anna and Ida um, lying in the sun, bas- basking in the sun, I basking. think I would say. Yeah. Basking. Um, and and everything's like, every little hair on their face is like perfectly lit, 
like mm-hmm. sun-kissed and beautiful and you think, yeah, okay, this is looking a bit more positive. <laughs> Things are looking up. Mm. <laughs> Yeah, so we don't know how much time has passed. We don't know where we are initially, uh, but it seems like it's not winter yet anyway. Um, and we meet the townsfolk and the people who Lucas is living with, which turns out to be this half Danish family of Carl and his two daughters who somehow nurse him, nurse Lucas back to health, which is great. Um, and for me, in many ways, this half was less interesting. Okay. On second watch, anyway, like, and when I say less, I mean very slightly less. Which is interesting because it's really where everything kicks off. It's true, yeah. Maybe I just love looking at Iceland. It's, I guess it's less about the place and more about the people in the second half. Mm. So, like I said before, we actually get conversations. We see a narrative develop. um, We see characters having relationships. We see... Lucas and Anna begin to develop something. Uh, The church is going up. We meet so many more people. But it still feels like something bad will probably happen. Mm. I think a key, there's a key scene in this half, isn't there? Which is a a wedding scene when the church is half built. Mm. And then again, we get that like 360 roving camera vibe where we get to see all the community doing their different things. Yeah. So we have like Ragnar... Playing an accordion. That man, Ingvar, so many talents. <laughs> we, <laughs> we have some people dancing, some people chatting, some people eating, running around. And it's like a snapshot of the whole community. That then, of course, turns into the wrestling scene. Love oh my the God. wrestling. Which is a real, like, you know, toxic masculinity battle. But also this battle of the titans between Ragnar and Lucas, of course, like becomes a physical one. Well, the, yeah, this is the thing, isn't it? It's like, it's for everyone there, it's a bit of fun. And uh, Carl gets tricked into doing it by Ida, who Ida is the light relief in this yeah, film, isn't yeah, she? Definitely. So much. But yeah, Carl gets tricked and he fights Ragnar, fine. It, they know each other, blah, blah, blah. But then for Ragnar to fight the priest, that's like, we've been waiting for this kind of head to head, physically, mm. the whole thing. It still came off a little bit comic. <laughs> Lucas is so gangly. Yeah, there's no way he would be able to actually put up a fight. Do you think Ragnar, Ragnar let him win? Ragnar would smash him. I would have thought. I, I, would, I mean, older. I thought. He's Built older, like a he's... brick shithouse. Yeah. Uh, but he doesn't win. Lucas mm. wins. I think maybe he did it on purpose. Trying to mm. like restore some sort of kinship. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah, I think that's right. Because we have a few moments in this half where Ragnar seems to just want to... Reach out. Reach out, not necessarily befriend, but like generally be sociable and and ask questions. And he asks him about, how do you become a man of God? Asks him, can he have his photo taken? He certainly does. And we'll talk about that. But Lucas doesn't want any of it. And he's just like, this man has helped you Mm. so much. And now he's... He's, he's even interested in what you're here to do. And he's like just sort of shrugging him off, blaming the language barrier and getting Ida in to do some translation, translating. But like, I, just, I don't know. What the hell is Lucas's problem? Okay, this film is a lot about a one priest's sort of spiritual journey, journey with his faith and stuff. I would say he's not the best priest. no. Also, his sermon, he seemed like so boring as a priest when he did that sermon. Oh, yeah, but they're probably all quite boring But I think his his issue with Ragnar is like a twofold thing. Okay. One, he's kind of disgusted by him because he's everything he's trying to fight against. Like, he's like, um, 
so I guess like vulgar, he would think mm. him, he would think him rough, he would think him like uncivilized. brazen, uncivilized, everything he's trying to fight against and, and, and prevent on the one hand. On the other hand, he also, in this battle of masculinity and power, clearly Ragnar is the winner, you mm. know? Yeah. And he's showing up. He's showing up by being like, "Oh, I can just like leap in this frozen field. Oh, I can just do all this thing." <laughs> he's showing the priest up to be weak, mm-hmm. feeble, um, like a delicate little piece of paper that's gonna just crumble in the in the wind. So, you, do you think Lucas is seeing that and feeling sort of vulnerable? Yeah. yeah. From that. Yeah. But that's not Ragnar's problem. Yeah, but th- that. But quite often when somebody hates somebody, it's not the person that they hate's <laughs> fault or no, problem, true. is it? No, that's true. So their relationship ultimately doesn't get any better from there. As much as we'd like this priest who, for whatever reason, is unable to get past his one goal and actually, I don't know, make religion seem worthwhile. <laughs> like he's come to this place and to me, he's not sold religion in any way. He hasn't done anything. He literally done no priest things on this the entire thing. Okay, he said some sort of words in a you know shoddy little funeral for the for (laughs) Tulka, and then he starts doing a sermon after the big moment. Mm -hmm. And he's like, "What is? How are you even a priest?" Yeah, he's rubbish, isn't he? He's he's a rubbish priest, but I'm sure it's probably far more deep rooted in his like. Christian guilt, but he's like stuff. one of those like internal, um, internal priests of this this era that's all you know like God's word. We must stick to, but that's not like I'm about the community and no. improving people's lives. He's about like you have to conform to God's. Oh, I suppose will. I don't, that's what he tells Ragnar, isn't it? Yeah, he's like, like he's not a kind of like God is in all of us, um, type of guy, is he? He's no. more commandments yeah he's more i will serve god you will serve god we should all serve god because it's good for us Mm. but he doesn't like yeah it's not the best way to sell a religion i don't know i stopped being religious so and that wasn't even because my priest was as bad as this one (laughs) (laughs) um but we touched on it there ultimately that relationship blows up doesn't it so the relationship that Lucas has had with Anna, where they've, for some reason, he's, he, he must be the only male yeah. in the entire southeast of Iceland. <laughs> because Anna falls for him. Yeah. And Men, we, we yeah, get those, not that convincing. Not that convincing. And we get a couple of scenes where they go horse riding and his ineptitude is endearing, mm. maybe. Mm. Not, didn't seem it to me, but okay. Anna isn't familiar with that many other men. Okay. Yeah, maybe she's just, you know intrigued by the prospect of a man Mm -hmm. if you know what i mean i do know what you mean especially because you just winked at me too (laughs) (laughs) um so they they have their thing Ida is just floating around being funny but she does say if you think you're gonna get with my sister then you you're gonna you've got another thing coming basically and carl their dad is always like don't do it don't do it he says some of his words a little bit too late because, yeah, they they have sex in the church, don't they? Anna? Is it in the church? I think it's in the Isn't church. Isn't it in his little shed? I thought that they. I thought that Lucas led her into the church. Do we not see that? Oh, I thought it was his little wooden shed. Where? Where? Oh, the wooden shed that they set up for him. Yeah. Oh, maybe. I don't know. I thought so. Oh, that would be very well. It comes. Dicey. It comes after he kills Ragnar. Oh right. And so, so I'm guessing he's just like, "Fuck this." Going to hell anyway. Um, yeah, sacrilege. Who gives a shit? I'm going to have sex in the church. But maybe that's just me. Um, mm. I don't know. But the big thing really is that Ragnar dies. Hmm. It was sometimes my mother taught all the dance on Sunday. The tradition here. I was not really interested in learning. But when you hear it every day, you begin to assemble it up. Whether you want it or not. 
synes, det er grimt sprog. Det føles forkert i hals. Nu bliver det træt af tals det. So the scene of Ragnar's death, well, the scene that culminates in Ragnar's death is one of the kind of key moments of the film, isn't it? Yeah. And we have this incredible, provocative monologue from Ragnar. So provocative. It's like you can just see him sort of, oh, he he's kind of gleeful as he says it. Yeah. So like he's basically, he starts by essentially saying, oh, you know, you've been talking to me like I'm a moron all this time. And I can speak Danish. Like, <laughs> ha, 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 the joke's on you. You thought I was an idiot. There's also a point where he says, you know, like, I am not an animal. Mm-hmm. Um, I am a human being. <laughs> he doesn't say that. That's the elephant, man. But it, the the theme there is very clear, isn't it? That he's been looked down on. He's been mm-hmm. judged. But just because what he he doesn't, like, live in a fancy little house doesn't mean that he doesn't have the smarts no exactly and this thing and he talks about why he doesn't speak danish mm, it's a choice yeah like he chose not it sounds cultural vulgar in his mouth cultural imperialism that's a phrase you're gonna that's... have to explain to me well it would just mean so like for example the spread of tea in british imperial places and cricket would be cultural imperialism okay yeah. so it's like exporting your ideas as mm. well as just like imposing your rule gotcha so language is often seen as like a form of cultural imperialism okay and in this yeah. case it would be for certain very yeah. strongly so ragnar decides he's had enough he's gonna reveal his hand and then he has this incredible monologue where he basically says, he basically lists his sins mm. and then says, pray for me after each of them. Yeah. Like, I didn't save someone I could have done. Pray for me. I laughed at someone when they were in pain. Pray for me. And it ends with, <laughs> I killed your horse. Pray for me. Yeah. Which tips Lucas over the edge. I mean, because I... Th- the whole of that second half, I was like, what an idiot. He's lost his horse. Then he loses Anna's horse. What a dick. But actually, Ragnar has specifically gone out of his way to kill the horse. So what is it with Ingvar Sigurdsson killing horses? <laughs> Why have we seen that happen twice? Yeah. Well, it's just a lot of horses in Icelandic films. Yeah, and the same guy has to kill them. <laughs> Sorry, but distracting I guess, from the, the chat. So I guess it's like his act of vengeance, right? After being treated like dirt. 100%, yeah. And he said, I'm not going to be violent, doesn't he? And he isn't until he has to be. That scream from Lucas scared the shit out of me. What, uh, in reaction to in, why I killed your yeah. horse? Yeah. Like he really, it's, I don't know, it's like a death cry. And he comes launching himself at... Ragnar. It's the final breaking point, isn't it? It's mm. that moment of, this is it. This is it? And it was it? And he fucking slams his skull on the rocks. He should have just taken his photo instead. But then after this, it's weird because that's kind of the climax of the whole film, it right? It really is. And in my mind, it was like five minutes to the end then. Like, oh, mm. he's dead. Now Lucas is going to die. But there's a bit more. Yeah, so we... He kind of is trying to do his first sermon in his silly, silly little white ruff. I mean, did he <laughs> have that in his bag ruff. the whole time of the journey over? I guess so. Me? I'm sure it like Fold folds down neatly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I mean, it becomes kind of farcical, doesn't it? When Ragnar's dog is is barking outside in a real kind of Banquo ghost at the feast vibe. Yes. Of, you know, like your crimes will come back to uh-huh. haunt you uh-huh. or... And um, actually, on that note, um, I read recently about this thing that people used to believe in called wondrous discovery, which okay. is basically somebody was mur- if somebody's murdered, that's the devil doing that, not God. But God will help you by uncovering the murder by natural means. So, like, wow, the that's dog, exactly what yeah, happens. the dog would, uh, the dog, God would get like a dog to to dig up the body so it was revealed, or would um. If like there was a dead body and the murderer went near it, the body would emit, start blood, would start bleeding. Um, but the dog one felt 
kind of relevant here. Um, but then we have like this farcical, like real farcical moment where Lucas runs out to tell the dog to get lost and slips in the mud. Yeah. Which is like a final humiliation. Completely. When he's doing his duty for God. And then he's like, well, I've just got to leave now in shame. Well, that's... <laughs> yeah, that, that, that We thought the final straw would be the murder, but actually it was just a bit of slapstick comedy. It's falling in the mud. Yeah. But I, that, you're so true. The Danish devil does some killing and then God, who has protected him through all, out, mm. all that kind of crazy nature, sends the dog to yeah. basically finish the job. Yeah. And it's, I guess it's the dramatic irony of the man who is there to preach the word of God is the one that does the murdering. Yeah. In the end, he falls from grace. But did he ever have grace to begin with? Well, or only in his own mind? You can't have that much grace when you're like six foot five, can you? <laughs> <laughs> I know, but what does it say? So if we talk about the wider theme of like Denmark and Iceland... Um, obviously this is very, something very close to the director's heart Kleena Palmerson being Icelandic but grew up in Denmark has a house there and, and lives there and things like that where do we think he lies on this kind of scale of like Denmark is good Iceland is bad uh, what, what does he want us to think about because well, for me Denmark I, is bad Iceland is good almost yeah. like a complete flip yeah yeah Iceland wins here I think Yeah, but I think it's probably a bit more subtle than that maybe it's talking more about the kind of histor this historical mm. relationship more than like anything reflecting on today well but- i had a really interesting message from someone who listened to our lff chat because he wanted to know more about godland and we're the only podcast that popped up having <laughs> talked about it which is pretty amazing uh so here we are going in a lot more depth but i wanted to read out what he'd said I haven't asked his permission, so I'm not going to use his name. Basically, he's a he's a Dane who went over to Iceland, has some Icelandic friends there. And in Iceland, he says, I was surprised by the amount of anti-Danish feelings I would mm. meet, especially after a few beers. <laughs> <laughs> we're all, you know, we're all this exposed like, when we've had a few beers. You know, Wales and England, it's yeah. always more when there's been a few oh, beers Oh, for involved. sure. Especially if there's sport involved as yeah. well. Um, and he said, yeah, which is a bummer when you were a fan of Icelandic culture. So... From his point of view, Denmark has n- no hard feelings with Iceland, potentially doesn't view it the way that they used to, but Iceland is still holding on to that kind of mm. uh, resentment of being looked down on for so long, maybe. Mm. Um, but it's a really interesting it's a really interesting message, and I just wonder how prevalent those feelings on both sides are. Like, is the history something that comes up often? in a modern Icelander or Danish person's mind. And certainly I don't walk around the UK, England, thinking about the times that people have invaded us. I'm not going around thinking. That's because we were the invaders. Oh, shit. (laughs) (laughs) That's true. But I think that that would, I think it would be fair to say and pretty pretty unarguable to say that an element of those sentiments and feelings from a historical context shape identities in or contribute to national identities of wales and scotland for example yes. of like an of a not necessarily combative but like d- b- stuff being defined in opposition to englishness right mm-hmm. and i guess that maybe it's a similar dynamic but i don't know enough about it no well Very if true. people do know more about it and i'm sure they do please like let us know i'd be f- mm. very very interested in the history behind Denmark and Iceland and the history of this film but yeah ultimately Iceland wins Carl does the deed does the final deed tracks Lucas down on his horse and stabs him to death (laughs) is that just because yeah see I think Carl is maybe the character that's um not as clearly defined for me okay um, because in some ways, you know, Ragnar's at the table and he says, oh, you know, this is what happens when you, and spill some wine. And Carl says, oh, this is what happens when you um, bring an Icelander in. So he's kind of like snobby and you get the sense that he sees himself as um, somebody who's going to be one of the most important figures in the town. And mm. he's going to try and like bo- bolster his own image. But then he also says about um, Lucas, you know, we don't need men like that. 
yeah, no one should have to marry a priest. We don't need more men like that. So I'm like, who's, where does his loyalties lie? And what's his motivation in killing Lucas? Is it just purely because he's, he doesn't want him to develop a relationship with his daughter? Or is it because he's like, you're an interloper, there's clearly something going on here and you've unsettled the apple car? Mm, mate, yeah, that. But also, don't forget, he is half Danish or Danish himself. Mm. So he probably knows potentially what Lucas is like, what he knows what the the culture of Denmark at the time is. So one of his own coming in, maybe he felt like, I want to be the only outsider here. Mm. We don't want another Dane, like you say, upsetting the apple cup. Interesting though, half and half, like mm. like uh, cleaner himself almost. But yeah, I guess he is less well-drawn. Um, but perhaps that's because he isn't as well defined being mm. a half half and half that's not the right word is it <laughs> um being yeah half icelandic half danish it's not as you can't have a stronger mm. opinion i don't know mm. certainly someone who feels that way is the director who clearly does have a strong opinion um but i don't know it does feel like iceland wins mm. if we were gonna actually fight <laughs> um and it, it all boils it's all it's all about that kind of butting heads and right the way down to the title like we are calling it godland as a film but it's got two titles <laughs> other than that and we talked about this before but in danish it's vanskapteland and in icelandic it's valathaland and i still haven't learned what the translation of valathaland is so if someone knows let me know because it's not i don't know maybe i think maybe it comes from the, the word miserable which mm. would fit uh it certainly is miserable most of the time, weather-wise and story-wise. <laughs> um, Van Skabteland means deformed land, deformed landscape. Um, and I have now just read that Valathaland means miserable land. So <laughs> nice to be... Which, you, which would you prefer? Miserable uh, land or deformed landscape? I think I prefer Godland, <laughs> um, which maybe, yeah, like I think we said before, it, it plugs into the themes of the film in a different way to those two because mm. miserable and deformed they kind they don't mean the same thing mm. but they're obviously coming from different points of view but miserable or deformed probably i probably prefer deformed yeah i just i don't want to be miserable <laughs> happy being deformed but not miserable So that was Godland, Van Skabteland, Valathaland, whichever you decide to use. It's the new film from Kleena Palmerson, and it's going to be on Curzon Home Cinema, I think, and at the cinemas in the UK from April the 7th. Um, another shout out to Ida, who <laughs> literally raises the kind of fun levels of this mm. film whenever she's on screen. Um, brilliant moments with Lucas. Like, he's very rarely smiling. And we get a great scene where he's trying to take her photo. And it all just seems so genuine, doesn't mm. it? Um, so she's brilliant. Uh, the dog. What a cute dog. Oh, yeah. Uh, we talked about the dog it's at like the end a of Quakes. Oh, fox. He did, didn't he? He's like properly fluffy and mm. cute. Um, and yeah, well, congratulations to everyone who made it. Um, when we did our last talk, they hadn't announced who won official competition at London Film Festival. Sadly, Godland did not win. Do you know what did? No. Corsage. Your tone of voice is suggesting you don't think that was a worthy winner. Well, I watched it last week on Mubi and it was fine. It was quite like dull. For oh. something about a rebellious uh, monarch 
it was just a bit sad and dull. Um, and not because, obviously, I'm going to big up Iceland wherever I can. I think out of the two that I've seen anyway, Godland should have won. Um, especially because Corsage did win and it wasn't that great. And I love Vicky Creeps as well. Mm. Um, so sad times, but uh, there you go. Can't win them all. There's a uh, Ragnar in, in the wrestling ring. <laughs> Taking his filmmaking to the next level in Godland, Kleena Palmerson delivers a thought-provoking, beautiful meditation on identity, language and religion. And we are totally here for it. Who do you reckon comes out on top in the battle of the countries? Iceland or Denmark? Do you have any personal experience of this divide? If so, we'd love to hear from you. Our email address is quickminderpod at gmail.com and we can be found on Twitter and Instagram where we're at quickminderpod. That's K-V-I-K-M-Y-N-D-A-P-O-D. And you can subscribe or follow us wherever you get your podcasts. We'd appreciate a rating and or review on Spotify and Apple Podcasts, which will help us get seen by more people. And if you're feeling extra generous, we have a Ko-fi page where you can support us if you like what you hear. All our links can be found on Insta, Twitter and in the show notes. Stay tuned for another trip around the cinema of Iceland. But for now, tack bless. Thanks and goodbye. <laughs>